morning, McCoy. My name is Gavin Paul McCoy. I'm one of the overseers here at McCoy. For those that are watching online that are not yet aware, we have resumed church service in the physical building, but with limitations to accommodate for the COVID-19 church protocol. For those that are in the sanctuary with us here, I thank you for your attendance, and I thank you for your patience as we navigate these church protocols. I understand that there's a great deal of frustration, and we all want to get back to singing and worshiping and fellowshipping as we had done prior to COVID-19. But be rest, rest assured, all of this is done for a reason. We don't want to jeopardize the health of those in the congregation, nor do we want to jeopardize the integrity of the Christian name so that the world does not see us as reckless virus spreaders. So I encourage you to continue wearing your mask. And I encourage you, encourage you as well that once church service is over, that you would exit the building rather than linger in the lobby. I know this is something that we do not like. I personally don't like it myself, but it is done as a temporary means. The rest of the leaders, including myself, are in the middle of discussion of how we can resume church life as it was prior to COVID-19. This is something that will happen very slowly and aggressively not overnight. So I ask that you would continue to be patient with us as we work and work through this and God instructs us and God provides us with all understanding and guidance of what it looks like. But nevertheless, we continue to ask for your patience. On another note, next Sunday, July 12th, we will be having communion. For those that are online, have your supplies ready. For those that are coming to the physical church, we as a church are unable due to recommendation that we do not provide food provisions. You will have to bring your own bread and drink for communion. And so be mindful of that. But nevertheless, let's jump into prayer. Father Lord, you value life. You value creation. You value it so much that it costs you a great price. It was sacrificial so that you would redeem us into your good graces. It is enough to have our heads bowed to the floor and revere you for your gracious and holiness and for all that you have done for us. We know that we are undeserving of this love, but you give it in that is grace. Grace that is so beyond us. And so we give thanks for it. And we praise you. And we glorify you. Because you value human life, God, we too value human life. And so I pray that you would give us patience as we orchestrate this new normal state. May you help us be understanding that relinquishing our freedoms and our rights and our privileges in church for the betterment of others is loving. And so God, I pray that your will be done. We pray that your will be done. That your sovereign hand would orchestrate what it, what it desires. May you be blessed, may you be honored, may you be glorified always and forever, God. In your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey everyone, it's Caleb here for Camp Wapiti. want to give you a quick update about the Camp Wapiti show, inviting everyone to tune in this Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Uh, for the premiere, and then you'll be able to watch it anytime you want after that, episode one of the Camp Wapiti live show. It's going to have everything you appreciate about a Camp Wapiti campfire. We've got uh, skits, we've got music, improv, some singing, speaker, and uh, Bible lesson, and sharing. All of that is coming at you every Wednesday. It's going to be between 40 minutes and an hour probably each week. So I'd invite all of you to join us for Camp Wapiti. If you can't make a Wednesday for the premiere, that's fine. You'll be able to watch every episode individually on the Camp Wapiti website is where it's going to be linked, campwapiti.ca. In addition, really excited to announce that we are working on some 
events, in-person events that we can do with campers now that things have opened up a bit. So we've got some in-person opportunities planned. We're going to be going down to a park with some cornhole boards. Uh, we're going to be doing a coronavirus, like physical distancing, uh, march for slushes from Muscoe CP Park. That's being planned. We're looking at renting the outdoor pool uh, based on the limits they have there and also doing some mini golf. Lots of events coming and the details are still being sorted out times and places. But the exciting thing is for these events, we've got some awesome individuals from our community and businesses who are partnering with us and are going to donate to camp based on participation in these events. So for example, the very first community event we're going to do starts right now. Every clip I get between now and Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday at noon, every 20 second clip I get from a phone or a camera that says, what camp means to you? Every one I get, I've got a sponsor, anonymous sponsor, they want to stay anonymous, who is going to donate $5 to camp for every clip that we get. So if your whole family sits down and everyone does a 10 to 20 seconds, just very short clip of what camp means to you, uh, every clip we get is 5 bucks for camp. So stuff like that, uh, for our, when we go to the park with a cornhole board, we've got a sponsor who's lined up to say, okay, so every kid from the park who wants to come and toss, they get a beanbag on the board that's a dollar to get it in the hole that's five dollars for camp and we have sponsors who are jumping on to these community events that we're doing so that we can raise money to help send some new kids to camp next year and to yeah just top up our budget so that we can have an awesome program when we go again next year really excited to share all this with you look forward to seeing you uh the camp wabity show and also some of these community events if you have any questions feel free to reach out we're hoping to get all that information for you very soon uh, but the camp is where you're going to find it and on the camp wabity facebook group see you later guys blessings good morning and welcome to mclaurin please join with us as we worship the lord today Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of Glory, the King of Heaven. You shake the world up when only God can. You lose His treasures.
Good morning. Um, my name is Jane Watt, and I will be reading the scripture today. The passage is um, Acts 20, 13 to 38. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going on foot. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went on to Militine. The next day, we set sail from there and arrived off Ch Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos and on to the following day, arrived at Milos. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sent out to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time when I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plot of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, 
I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. I only aim to finish this race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task to testify to the good news of God's grace. Now, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I decide that to I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare your flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, with tears. Now, I commit to you, God, and the word of his grace, which can build up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anybody's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions in everything In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. And they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. Thanks, Jane. All righty, McLaurin, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 20. And before we get there, I just want to say thank you. I love being on this stage. I do not like preaching in front of a camera. Uh, so it's awesome to be kind of gathered together. I think it's amazing that we're together. Jesus says, you know, whenever two or more are gathered, there I will be. And whether we're in proximity or online, just want to kind of call out to everyone who's kind of gathered and worshipped with us. Because the heart of worship is Jesus. We make it all about Jesus. And, and I kind of feel like that's Paul's final words, right? Now, the question I have for you is, <clears throat> if, if this was your final day or you didn't have that much time left, what would you say to your family, to your friends, to those around you? What would, you what, would, what would your last words be to them? Because today we kind of come across what Paul calls, I think, his final words to the elders in Ephesus. And it's probably the longest address to Christians that we have recorded from Paul. Right? And... and, and he basically says, none of you will see me again. And so it's almost like Paul is writing or speaking his eulogy. And it's, I think, kind of our takeaway, the question I have for you is, if you had to write your eulogy right now, what would it sound like? What would it be? And I think it's a really powerful and profound passage. And it's a very powerful and profound exercise for all of us to really think about what our life sum, the sum of our lives, is all about. And I think that's what Paul talks about in this passage as he addresses the Ephesians. Let's pray and then we're going to jump into the story. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. We praise you for Luke as he wrote these words down, as he followed Paul in his journeys, Lord. As we look at Paul's words, Lord, I pray, Lord, that, yeah, you would just guide us. There are some amazing words about a man who seeks after you. And we want to grow and we want to learn more about that. And so in that way, write them deeper into our hearts, Lord, and guide us, Lord, 
as we look into Paul's life. Thank you, God. Amen. So like I said, my question today for you is, what would it look like? What would it sound like for you to sit there and say, you know, these are my final words. But before we get there, I just want to kind of locate ourselves in the story. And we're going to look at Paul's address, flip to the next slide. And these are basically Paul's plan. Paul is on his third missionary journey. And it seems like he's kind of wrapping up his third missionary journey. And where we left Paul last time was he was in Ephesus for like two years. And now he's looking to kind of go back to Jerusalem. And on the way, he's going to take the long way around. And he's going to visit Macedonia and he's going to visit Greece. These are all of the places that he's gone to uh, in his second missionary journey. The places that he's planted churches like uh, Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, Athens, and Corinth. And so he basically visits all of them, and I think it's a way of like encouraging and building up the churches that he's been there. And he says it's, he spends three months in Greece. From what we know, he wrote the book or the letter to the Romans during that time. And when we, when we kind of piece it all together, basically Paul is wanting, his intentions is to actually go to Spain. Spain. Flip to the next slide. This is a picture of Paul's missionary journeys. And it's all in the eastern half of Europe, what we call Europe today, or Asia Minor. And basically, I think he's saying, I've tapped this out. Like, I've kind of gone through this area, and I want something new. And he's like, I want to go west. I want to keep going on to Spain where there's new ground, where I can proclaim the gospel. That's just kind of a heart of what Paul's, Paul's heart is and how much he wants to proclaim the gospel. I love that. I wanted to show that just in a second. So basically, now he's starting to head back to Jerusalem. Um, and it seems like probably to inform Jerusalem, what he is doing, and also probably gander up more support for his trip to Spain. And on the way he back, he stops off not in Ephesus, but Miletus, which is about 50 kilometers away from Ephesus. And he doesn't want to stop there. But before I get there, before I kind of get there, he also stops off at Troas. And I, I need to say one thing about Troas before I kind of go on. He's, like I said, rushing towards Jerusalem. Flip it to the next slide. He stays about a week in Troas. And while he's speaking, we meet this fellow named Titius. The dude falls asleep while Paul is preaching, falls out of the window and dies. Here's the moral of the story, friends. Do not fall asleep during sermon time. Okay? Like, your life, your very life depends upon it. Like, you, it's like, that's the point of the message. I almost thought, like, I should do the whole sermon on this, but I needed to move on. Your very life depends on it. Like, you could physically die just like this dude, or, like, you know what? You could die metaphorically or, or, or spiritually. After all, when we're preaching the good news, that's the word of life, right? Any which way. Don't write me a letter. Maybe, maybe I am reading a little deep into that. So let's go. <laughs> let's get on to our story. Let's flip it to the next slide. So basically, from Troas, he finds himself in a place called Miletus. Like I said, it's about 50 kilometers away from Ephesus. He calls the Ephesian elders. And verse 22 to 25 pretty much set the context of what Paul will say. And this is what he says. I'm heading to Jerusalem. I've been compelled by the Spirit. So the Spirit is leading me. I know that hardships, affliction, and prison await me. And my life, my life, my life's worth is only to finish the race. And I will never see you again. Flip to the next slide. Think about that for a second. I will never see you again. So these are my final words to you. What an amazing picture. What Paul is talking about, like I said, is he's giving his own eulogy to the Ephesians. It's a kind of a combo deal of testimony and encouragement and legacy. And if there's anything that I've known, is that that, um, knowing that 
or time is short or the reality of death seems to remind us or focus us in, in a way that nothing else does, focuses us to like what is really important in our lives and how should we live. Like every time I'm at a funeral, every time I'm at a funeral, it reminds me of the brevity of life and the significance of our choices. So flip this next slide. So here's the takeaway. If I want us, I want you, I want us to take some time this week and to write out our own eulogy. And I'll give you a little bit more instructions around it, right? And if, it, if you take this seriously, this is not a five-minute exercise. This is going to take you a few hours. And why should we do this? Why should we do this? Because we want to finish well. well we kind of all know that, right? Like, it doesn't matter how you start. It doesn't matter how you run the race. What really matters is how you finish, right? It doesn't matter that you start, start going to school. What matters is you graduate. It doesn't matter that you start a project. It's how you finish the project, right? We all kind of know that. When we want to finish well, and how do we finish well? Well, what does our finish line look like? Can we kind of frame up, like what would it look like? What does our finish line look like? And then we look back. I love what Joyce Meyer says. She says, wisdom is choosing to do now what we will be happy with later. I think that's an amazing definition of wisdom, is that we choose now to do what we know we will be happy with later. No regrets, no redos. And I think, you know, when, when I was looking at this and, and thinking about this, I realized that uh, life coaches do this a lot. They tell their clients, you know what, write out your eulogy. So here you got, you get free life coaching today. So flip it to the next slide. This is what I want you to do. I want you to write it out twice. Once is, what would it read like right now? If you were to write your eulogy right now, like, you know what, what has my life been like? And then, I want to ask you to rewrite it. How would you like it to read? How would you like it to read? And that's kind of what I did this week as I read Paul's words. I, I tried to l write both like my eulogy as of like, you know, what would it look like right now? And what would I like it to read? And, and, and I did it in light of Paul's words. Flip it to the next slide. And I kind of picked out like six things that Paul wrote about Paul, Paul, in Paul's address in what I call Paul's eulogy. And I thought, these are some of the six things that I want my life to look like. These are some of the things that I want to kind of grow in. I, I want my eulogy at the end of it to sound a little bit more like Paul's in these areas. And Paul says that my life is about character. My life is about purpose and calling, God's purpose and calling for me. My life is about a clear conscience. My life is about perseverance, running the good race, not being disqualified, not being taken out. My life is about building others up. And my life is about contentment. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just share with you some of the thoughts that I kind of came up with. So this is maybe more of a reflection of my exercise walking through this, how I've kind of grown in just reading Paul's words. And I hope you consider this. Flip to the next slide. Paul says, my life is about character. He starts right off the bat. He says, you yourselves know how I lived. He doesn't sit there saying, not what I lived or what I did or here's all my accomplishments. He doesn't sit there and say, hey, look, dudes, uh, I wrote half the New Testament. Uh, and I planted X number of churches. And you know what? I was the leader at this church. And, you know, I pastored here. and there. No, he says, this, you know how I lived. My character. And we all know this. God cares more about who you are than what you have or what you have done. That our character is much more valuable than our material possessions and our achievements. Like, like we kind of know this. The scripture talks about like the fruit of the spirit is joy, love, joy, peace, forbearance, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It doesn't say the fruit of the Spirit is some amazing achievements and you get to do all sorts of things. It's like character. It's character. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, what these, it's like the hardships of life, it's the things that we do, is greater worth than gold which perishes. Everything else perishes. Your character doesn't. And you know what? You don't have to be a Christian to know this. Like, you go to any funeral, and you know what? It's not your boss that comes up and says, there's like, man, Peter was amazing. He was an amazing worker, and he achieved this, 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 and that. Not really. You, it's not your banker. Uh, I'm looking at Derek Chance, who comes to, sorry, Derek. Uh, just, you're just front and center. It's not your banker who comes up and says, you know what? Pete's net worth was this. Like, you know what? How miserable of a life would I think I lived if my banker came up, punched a number on the screen and says, that's Peter's net worth. I don't care what kind of number that is. I don't care if it's like seven or eight digits. I would think that I lived a miserable life if that was my, my funeral. We all kind of know that. So why aren't we kind of changing? Flip it to the next slide. Paul sits there and says, hey, you know how I've lived. I have been a servant. I have been generous. I have been worked hard with humility. I have been selfless. I have, been per, I have persevered. I have been faithful. I have been discerning. I have been courageous, bold, wise, intelligent, sensitive. He says that he does this with tears, that he's loving, caring, committed, and joyful, faithful to the end. And I ask the question, at the end of my life, Flip to the next slide. How do I want to live? How do I want to live? What are the things that I want to grow in? And, I, and, and here's where I, you know, I'm going to just give you a little bit of the things that I have learned in my time. How to grow in character. You don't kind of grow in character with wishfully thinking and just like, I want to be a loving person. I think these are some of the things that we need to consider as you Write out your eulogy. Identify characters that you, characteristics that you want to grow in. And you know what? Pray for them every day. God says, be persistent. Ask, seek the Lord. And then find and meditate on scripture. Like if, if you're sitting there thinking, I want to kind of grow in love or patience or, or courage. Like, well, let's take love. Well, memorize and meditate upon like John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved. Like how did God love? Well, he gave. Well, how am I loving? How am I going to? Or maybe we, or maybe meditate on the parable of the good Samaritan. Am I more like the good Samaritan? Or am I more like the Levite and priests that walked by? And how can I kind of grow in that? And ask God and share and seek. And then identify growth circumstances. I call them failures or successes. Ask yourself when you sit there, it's like, you know, what did I do over here? Ask yourself, how did it make me feel? And what were the triggers in my heart? And be honest. And then ask God, how? How, God, do you want me to respond? How do you want me to grow in this character? And then just share and pray and seek and do it every day. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, this works. Why? Because God said, whoever seeks me will find me. I was praying with a, a fellow this week. And he was praying over me. And something shocked me. He kind of said, there's like, thank you God for Peter. And that he is slow to anger. And I've never thought of myself as slow to anger. And I thought to myself, like, wow, that's been something that I have asked God for in different seasons of my life. That God would make me patient, long-suffering. And I thought to myself, wow. 30 years of journeying with God. And God changes. I thought, that's like, man. I was just, I, I don't know, it was almost bringing tears to my eyes. I gotta move on or else I will cry. Anyway, let's go, flip it to the next slide. God, thank you, amen. Um, oh, now I lost my thought. Okay, <laughs> Paul sits there and says, um, my life is about serving the Lord and declaring the gospel. This is his purpose and calling. And I thought sometimes 
When we talk about purpose and calling, you know, it kind of seems vague. And this is one way that somebody has explained it to me. And I know that there's overlap between purpose and calling. So, you know, just, just take, it with, with, take it as it is, right? But purpose is really the direction of my life. The one thing my life is all about, right? Remember in uh, previous chapters when Paul began, came to Christ, uh, God says, I've set you apart to proclaim the gospel, to serve the Lord that way. That's Paul's purpose. And then calling is really the context of my life, where I'm living out my purpose, right? In Paul's life, He says that he goes wherever the Spirit leads him. The Spirit led him here. He stopped him from going there. And wherever he goes, in every single place that Paul does, he says that he's proclaiming the gospel, his purpose. He's going to serve the Lord. Whether it's in jail, whether he's in chains, whether he's shipwrecked, whether he's pastoring a church, whether he's before courts and tribunals, he's proclaiming the gospel. And I thought to myself, As a Christ follower, I think all of us have to think that our purpose is to follow and serve Christ. Because that's what it means to be a Christ follower. That Christ is my Lord. So what does it look like? And I don't think it has to look very spectacular. It reminds me of Colossians chapter 3. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Work at it as if for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. I've said this before. I don't think that has changed. I have changed since being an engineer or a pastor. You know, that, that we work at it as if for the Lord. And so really our purpose has much to do with the attitude in which we bring the way and how we do it, just like we have talked about just a second ago, character, how we do things, that we do things for God's glory, for his honor, for his credit, that we acknowledge him, we praise him. We, he gave us the strength and ability to do things. We steward our energy and our talents for him. We serve others and love others the way he served and loved us. That's how we, that's how we glorify God. That's how we serve God. That's how I want to serve God. Flip it to the next slide. And so the question I have is like, am I serving the Lord? Like, what occupies my thoughts, my time, my effort? Would God say right now, would God say that I have served him? And I continue to tell others that, you know, this is how my priorities in life, I want my priorities in life to look like. God, spouse, family, work, hobbies. That as I love, serve God, I want to out of that outflow, serve and love my spouse, serve and love my family, serve and love people I work with and how I work. And I serve and how I do my hobbies. I want that to mark my life. So I go ask the question, what is, our, what is your purpose? And I ask that over and over. Flip it to the next slide. And I want to talk a little bit about calling. A little bit about calling. Because, um, how would I put this? I want to be content and at rest with wherever God places me. And that's not always the case for me. There's been times... Oh, lots of times where I strive and I want to get ahead. I want to get ahead of God. I want to do something more than I think God has, where God has placed me. I often compare. It comes out of like comparison, like, hey, look at that person. He's further ahead. I want to be further ahead. I want to, or whatever. And I kind of feel like it's, it comes out of, or it's fueled by a growing trend or lie in the culture that says that our calling has to be grand and great. It has to be big and lofty and splashy. It's not good enough just to be a servant. It's not good enough to just work a simple job and serve others. It's not good enough to be a house mom. It's not good enough just to be mom and dad. That in recent times, they talk about like, you know, they've had many surveys um, that today when you survey people and say, you know, what's your goal Almost always, fame and fortune, fame, is near or at the top of it. I want to be famous. 
It wasn't like that in the, in the 70s. Fame didn't even factor into it in the 70s when they took surveys like this. But today, it's like, I want to do something extraordinary. I want to be spectacular. I want to do something where lots of people notice me. And if I can't do something significant, I'll do something outlandish and shocking so that people will notice me. You notice social media? Oh, gosh. And that just flies. I think it flies against everything that Jesus taught and lived. If we take seriously what, what, Jesus, what, what Paul talked about, uh, what, how he described Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, being very nature God, he's the son of God, he stepped down from his throne in heaven to be what? A king? To be the most greatest man on earth? No. To be a servant of all. You have to think, if he is the son of God, if he is God himself, couldn't he orchestrate it so that he comes in a little bit more spectacular way? And yet throughout his life, he never leverages, quote unquote, his fame in order to become famous or rich. I think what Jesus teaches us, what Jesus demonstrates in his life is that greatness and obscurity are not opposite things. Greatness and obscurity are not opposite things. He was born in Nazareth to some peasant parents, and he is the greatest person who ever lived. I can't help but think of um, Billy Graham's words. Billy Graham was probably the most, um, most well-known, uh, most famous uh, evangelical in the 20th century, and at the height of his ministry, he was asked, who is the most important or who is the greatest Christian leader you know? And this was his words. He says, you wouldn't know them because they're living out in some sort of jungle in Africa in complete obscurity. You wouldn't even know their name. He who is first is last. He who is last is first. And I think this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'll leave it at this. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned them, just as the Lord has called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. He's not against ambition. He's not against like, you know, getting going further. He's just saying that's not what should mark you. For the one who was a slave when he was called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's free person. Similarly, he who is free is called Christ's slave. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were called in to. We can, we can serve God. We can love God. We can make an impact for God wherever we are called. Flip it to the next slide. So the question is, what or who am I serving? And I ask that question. It's like, when I am doing blank, whatever blank is, when I'm doing whatever, is it for, who is it for? And where? Is it work, school, home, neighborhood, community? And, and I, I thought, man, this week I had to repent of many things. And I just leave that for you. I need to keep going. Flip it to the next slide. And Paul's life, Paul says, my life is about a clear conscience. Therefore, I declare to you today, I am innocent of the blood of anyone. And I didn't hesitate to proclaim the gospel. And so he's basically saying, I, 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 owe, I don't owe anyone anything, right? I, I'm com I've completed the task for God. There's no regrets. There's peace in my life. I've reconciled all of my debts. I've fulfilled all of my obligations. And when I thought about that to myself, I thought, okay, have I shared the gospel the best I could? And second, have I dealt with all of my debts? Have I for have I forgiven and asked for forgiveness wherever? Is there closure? Flip it to the next slide. And this is what I kind of leave. Who do I need? The question that I had for myself was, who do I need to share with, share the gospel with? Am I holding back in certain areas of my life? Am I holding back when, when I'm relating with this person or that person? And I, I want to like have tact and I want to be sensitive to it, but am I holding back? Second, do I need to forgive someone? 
And for me, this is like being attentive to my emotions, right? And what I mean by that is recognizing strong or out of proportion emotions, right? Like when somebody cuts me off, right? Do I kind of sit there's like, oh, I'm going to go torch their car. It's like, well, it's maybe there's something there. And I found that, you know, this, for example, um, a little while ago, I found myself being ungenerous, kind of defensive, almost exacting whenever I was responding to people in need. And I just stopped and I asked God, like, what, what's kind of going on? And over the course of time, I realized I had not fully forgiven a time when one of my best friends kind of ripped me off. I had kind of thought I had dealt with it, but somehow there was still something holding on to my heart. And I released that debt. And debt forgiveness is really releasing that debt. That they, they no longer, this person who has offended me, no longer needs to repay that. And you know what? Forgiveness has much more to do with me than it does them or their situation. Forgiveness, like, yes, they hurt you. But unforgiveness is letting them or that situation continue to hurt you over and over again. I heard it said this week, bitterness is like drinking poison and thinking that the other person will die. It's just ludicrous. And I thought, no, I want no regrets. I want to live with a clear conscience. Is there people that you need to forgive? And is there people that you need to ask forgiveness of? And ask God. Flip it to the next slide. Keep going. And then Paul says that his life, he perseveres. He maintains his integrity. He's going to run the good race. He's not going to be disqualified. He's not going to let others distract and take him off the course. He basically says, keep watch over yourself. Keep watch over yourself. Be on guard. Why? Because they're savage wolves. You're going to encounter wolves along the journey. And what do those wolves do? Well, they distort the truth in order to draw you away. You see, every sin is a distortion of the truth. Right from the beginning to the end. All sin is a distortion of the truth. The lie that there is something more than God. Something more lovely than God. Something more beautiful than God. Something more valuable and worthy than God. Something more secure than God. Something more soul satisfying than God. Something that will complete me better than God. And that takes us out of the race. And Paul says, our defense, commit yourself to God. Commit yourself to the word of God, which will build you up and hold you to the end. Flip it to the next slide. And I think in some sense, he, is, he says that again in his letter to the church in Ephesus. It's like put on the whole armor of God. Let me read this to you, and then we'll just kind of move on from there. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It's like commit yourself to God. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. Think about that. It's about the lies. It's about the brokenness. Therefore, put on the full armor of God when the days of evil come and you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Hold on to God's truth. Keep it with you. And with the breastplate of righteousness in place, keep God's righteousness before you always with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace walk in the gospel walk in the gospel walk in the gospel in addition to all of this take up the shield of faith your faith is your shield strengthen it build upon it to which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is 
the word of God. The word of God. The word of God. Flip to the next slide. So here's what I said. I looked at myself and I said, what are the things that erode? What are the things that distort? It's another way of putting it. I probably, like, what are the things that distort my faith, my integrity, my commitment to God, <laughs> to my wife? What are the things that distort my honesty, my joy, my peace, my love, right? my patience, my kindness, kind of the wisdom and discernment? What are the things that distort my service to God, generosity and care for others? What are the things that distract me? What are the things that tempt me? What are the lies that I seem to hold on to? And then, on the opposite end, because I, it's not just about cutting out, but about increasing and filling ourselves with better things. It's filling ourselves with better things. What are the things that increase all of those things? And I want more of that. What are the things that increase my faith, increase my joy for God, increase my care and my generosity? And Paul writes it in Philippians 4, 8. It says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, focus on them. Pull it in. Draw more from Paul says, I commend to you God and his word. God and his word. Increase my trust. Increase my righteousness. Increase all of that. Let's keep going. I gotta keep going. Chapter five. Paul says, my life is about building others up. And we've already said this, right? At, at your funeral, right? Your job, your bank account, your house is not coming to your funeral. But instead, Paul says, you know what? I declare to you only what is profitable, what is beneficial to you. I pay careful attention to the flock. I help the weak. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Paul sits there and says, I live my life to build up others. What matters most to people, and what matters most to God is people. Didn't Jesus says, say, Something along the lines, whatever you did for the least of mine, you did for me. That's how much God cares and loves his people. And so when I thought about it, I thought, it's like, okay, is my life about generosity? Is my life about investing in others? Is my life about journeying with others and loving others? And how am I going to grow in that? Flip it to the next slide. We talked about this last week, so I'm not going to say, but we, we end it with this. It says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 22, it says that if it is with you, basically the, in Corinth, there was like, you know, we want more spiritual gifts. We want more God in our lives. Since you're eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. Basically says, if you want more God, build up the church. So how can I build up others? Who can I build up today? I'm asking God. Like all of a sudden church is a mission, right? Church is not I come to church and this is what I can get out of church. It's I come to church. Who can I bless? Who can I listen to and give and speak life into? Do I, am I going to pray before I come to church? God, you know what? Bless me right now so that I can be a blessing to someone else as we gather in our small groups our fellowships, over Zoom. Who can I bless today? Flip it to the next slide. Let's keep going. And finally, Paul sits there and says, my life is about contentment. And he says it this way, I have not coveted anyone's gold or silver or clothing. And the hands of mine have supplied all my needs and I work hard. Think about that for a second. And when I thought about that, I thought about two things. To not covet means to be contented and to be full. To be contented and full. Flip to the next slide. Contentment, and I think contentment, is knowing where true contentment comes from. Right? He says, uh, Paul's, I mean, not, the, well, the writer of Hebrews says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, not what you don't have. Be content wherever you are, whatever God has supplied, because God is with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And you have everything. If I have God, I have everything. God is with you. We have that. And Jesus says it. 
one of my favorite passages. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures. What are treasures? Contentment. Treasures on earth where moth, vermilion, destroy, where thieves break in. But store for yourselves contentment, treasures in heaven where moth, vermilion can't, where thieves can't. For where your treasures are, there your heart, your contentment is. Jesus is saying, he's trying to distinguish what real treasures are. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, there, there are neat little trinkets and treasures on earth. But what Jesus is saying is that they'll never last. They're fleeting, right? They're, they're temporary, and they can be taken away from you. After all, how many times have I said, why is it that we think more of the same stuff we already have will somehow bring us contentment? It's like more bike, more house, more clothes, more whatever it is you have. M more, more iPad, more iPhone, more, more. And it hasn't. Do you know that? The, and here's where I, I love when social sciences kind of catch up to the Bible. Study after study, and it's more and more literature coming out of from it. More and more studies about contentment and happiness have this to say, that basically more actually makes you discontent. More actually makes you unhappy. That, that, that he who dies with the most toys still dies is so totally true. And it's actually more than that. He who dies with the most toys is probably the most unhappy. And why do they say that you're more unhappy? Because what they found is that the more you have, the less you're grateful for it. That you become numb to the stuff that you have. And all of a sudden, you're not grateful for it. It doesn't matter that you get more. You're just more numb to it. And then second thing is that you get overwhelmed with all the junk. Right? Like you got like storehouses of junk. Why do we think we have this movement to minimalism? I'm not saying get rid of all your stuff. But isn't that the heart of minimalism? Declutter? Because like, you know what? I'm getting overwhelmed with all my junk. And then... Here's something that, that it's just right out of, straight out of Jesus' mouth. He says that the more you get, the more you realize it's not as good as you thought it was, would be. It couldn't quite satisfy you. You get disgruntled. You, lose, you get disillusioned. You lose hope for junk. Some good stuff, don't get me wrong. But it can't satisfy my soul. Flip it to the next slide. And I realize that my life is about contentment. It's also about being full, being filled. This last week, I, was, I think it was a little last week this week, or was it the week before? Basically, my kids were like, you know, grabbing out the ice cream, and they're like shoveling ice cream into bowls, and they were like, Dad, do you want some ice cream? And to my shock, I said, no, I don't want to eat ice cream. And y'all know how much I love ice cream. The reason I declined was that day, we had this wonderful meal, and I was full. And I didn't think ice cream would add anything to it. And so it is. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, but it's, that's, so it is with our hearts and our spiritual life. When we are filled with God. His care and his love fill us. His friendship satisfies our longing for significance. As we experience that, we experience the wonder of our Father's provisions. We're going to find that our yearning for other things start to diminish. Fix your eyes on Jesus and the things of the world seem to go dim. Isn't that what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3? Three, three. I count it all a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Let's flip it to the next slide. Let's keep going. That is Paul's eulogy. My life is about character. My life is about God's purpose and calling. My life is about a clear conscience. My life is is about perseverance, running the good race. My life is about building others up. My life is about contentment. Next slide. Here's where I end. It's your turn. 
You've just, I've just told you how some of my journey this week as I wrestled with Paul's words kind of played out. And I leave that to you. How would you, your final words, if today was today, sound? And second, how would you like it to read? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you once again for the life that Paul lived. I love the fact that he lived um, for character, for your purpose, for your calling, for a clear conscience to persevere, to build others up, that his life was about contentment. And I pray, Lord, that those words that his testimony kind of wouldn't fall on hard soil, that our hearts would be soft to that, that we want to grow. We want to grow in character. We want to grow in purpose and calling for you. We want to kind of grow in, in having a clear conscience. We want to grow in persevering and running the race well and finishing well and building one another up and in contentment, true contentment. And so, Lord, will you guide us? Holy Spirit, kind of convict us. Help us to grow. Help us to take seriously that all the moments of our lives are significant. And that at the end, when we look back, we will see your work in our lives. And we could could say with Paul, that we have run a good race. And that's kind of our prayer, Lord. It's our desire. And we lay that before you. Thank you, God. Thank you. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what an amazing, I, like I said, I love being up here and praising and worshiping God together. Is there a final word, Caleb? You're kind of running up here. Hello, is this on? I just wanted to really quickly say, uh, during the course of the service, after seeing the the camp video that I put up there, I had a message from someone who wanted to say anonymous, saying that they're going to add five dollars per clip to donate to camp that we get. So, so every clip that you send in, ten to thirty seconds, saying, "Hey, this is what camp means to me," that's ten bucks for camp. And you can just send them. There's a on the camp Facebook group, or you can send them to me personally. Yep, you can send them into the church office at NBC, any, any way. But that is awesome, because this money will help. Uh, yeah. We got some generous people here. I wanted to share that so the people out there can hear it too. Look forward to seeing your clips. So you got two homework assignments. Write your eulogy, and then make a little clip about Camp Wapiti and what it means to you. And so after the benediction, the ushers are going to be, uh, so please remain seated after the benediction. The ushers are going to usher you out in kind of a quick, expedient way. Thank you. It's awesome to just be able to gather and worship. Our benediction comes from 1 Peter chapter 5. May the God of all peace, who has called you to his eternal grace in Christ, restore, establish, and strengthen you. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name. Amen.